I never really planned on being a lawyer. I used to like actually get so stressed out in the morning that I would eat breakfast sometimes and go throw up. Cause I mean, I was one man. I'd, I don't know, there's a few really crazy things. We had a whole trial over a dog. We went to a mediation at the courthouse and we get there and the mediator goes, uh, I just heard something this morning, guys. And I don't think this case is gonna get resolved today. Hey everyone, welcome back to Milwaukee Uncut. For today's episode, we have one of our partners, Russell Nicolay, the man on 250-ish and counting billboards across the state of Wisconsin, I believe Minnesota, North Dakota as well. Now, he's in the studio. It was a fun episode. If you're interested in learning what the weirdest laws in Wisconsin are, we go over that. We go over some of his favorite Wisconsin spots. And it's a good, it's a good Wisconsin business story. He has a really interesting background, didn't really want to get into law, then ended up being a lawyer, started his firm just as himself in the early 2000s and has grown it into what it is today with several branches and growing. Um, you've seen him all over the place. He was in the studio. We're also very thankful for Nicolay's support of the podcast. So let's dive in with Russell Nicolay. A lot of people don't know a lot about you. They've, they're starting to see you everywhere. I think I started seeing you for the first time maybe last summer on my drive up to Green Bay and you kept just popping up and popping up and I was like, who, who is this guy? But how did you initially get your start? You've been going at it for a while. Yeah, I'm almost on my 17th year and uh, end of April will be 17 years as a lawyer for me. So it's been a, it's been a long ride, uh, many years before I started popping out of all the billboards everywhere. Uh, even though my first billboard actually was in, I think, 2009. But yeah, I started out in 2007 in April of 2007 as a lawyer up in Hudson, Wisconsin. Then I got licensed in Minnesota. Eventually I was licensed in North Dakota as well. So, uh, but I started out in Hudson, Wisconsin. I was born in Green Bay, but my wife is from Hudson. And long story short, I was gonna go to Marquette for law school. I was accepted. I was also accepted to a law school, which was called William Mitchell in the Twin Cities. And my wife, I was dating at that time, lived in Hudson. So I was like, hey, you know what? I'll go check out the William Mitchell in the Twin Cities. And one of my buddies that had gone to Stevens Point with me, um, I didn't know he was going to be there, just ended up at like the, this is kind of like not orientation because we hadn't made a decision yet, but it's a day where you tour and they like try to wine and dine you a bit to, to get you to go. And then I was like, oh, I don't know, this might not be bad. I've never lived in the cities. And so that's where I ended up. But it's kind of cool because I, I grew up on the east side of Wisconsin. Um, I was born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but I lived in Sheboygan, I think starting when I was like in preschool, then moved up to Green Bay and lived there until I graduated college. And uh, so we used to come to Milwaukee a lot and it's awesome being back in Milwaukee and having an office in Milwaukee and now like physically, like being here today is great. I love Milwaukee, so. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you and happy to be seeing your face all over the city right now. You're really rivaling. I mean, Gruber's just been all over the place for 20 years. It's nice to see a, a new, younger, better bearded face pop, <laughs> popping up around town. Yeah, <laughs> I saw some Gruber boards on the way in and I was thinking like we're kind of the total opposite because, you know, he's got the he's got the long hair, at least in some of his billboards now. And I, I don't you know, I've just got the, the long beard. No, so. he's got he's got you beat in the hair department. He's oh, yeah. got me in the hair department, too. And I, I'm a little younger than him. You and I got to stick to wearing these hats. <laughs> yeah, congrats to Gruber on the hair, man. I love it. Like, wait, a, good job. with that. How's your company evolved? You started as one person with one office. I believe you're was it your cousin who was working for you as a paralegal? Yeah. He's still with the company, Yeah, I believe. Nope. How did things grow from there? Yeah, so I rented a room. I think it was like 12 by 15 or something in downtown Hudson. It was in this building where like the old, uh, I think it was called the Hudson Star Observer, the old paper, and uh, just got a little room. And it was funny because you opened the door into my office and that's like where, right where I was sitting. It was kind of embarrassing because one time an opposing attorney stopped by and he opens the door and he's like, oh, sorry, man. And and then he asked if I could print something, and I'm like, "Sound." I'm like, that was really new. Didn't have much stuff. Didn't have much money. And he goes, um, hey, "Can you like print a copy of this for me?" And I'm like, "Man, I just I ran out of paper." <laughs> so yeah, that was. But basically, I would just kept taking anything that I made. I reinvested into the business, like marketing and trying to grow it. And my cousin, um, he had gone to what was called Chippewa Valley Technical College. I think it's still the same. And he did the paralegal program there. And he was working. I don't know if it was a, it was like some kind of title company or whatnot. And I'm like, Hey man, you want to, I need somebody to like do my paralegal work and things like that and help me. And he was like, Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. And so that was back in 2007 and yeah, he still works there today. So that's cool. A lot of family working yep. for you. Yep. My, uh, so 
my cousin, obviously, he joined, and then my brother was in the Army. He was going to Madison. He dropped out of Madison, went to the Army, got injured. Um, his now wife, but at that time was his girlfriend, we we kind of like came up with this plan to like convince him to go back to Madison, get his degree, and then he went to St. Thomas Law School, and then he joined me. So that was pretty awesome. My, that's my brother, two years younger than me. And then my other brother, who's eight years younger than me, um, it's kind of a cr cool story, but like... My mom and dad split up, so when I would go back home, he we like had this like duplex we lived in. I was kind of when I was in college, I was practicing for what we call the the LSAT to get into law school, and I was like taking taking practice tests and doing this stuff. And I remember getting really frustrated, so I was like, "Dude, just take this." And he was a little kid then, and he did pretty good on it. I'm like, "Man, either I'm an idiot, or I'm really <laughs> overthinking this," and it really was. Like, I was overthinking it, and I didn't think anything else of it. But that was cool, you know. Um, and then he ended up going to Eau Claire. And then one day he tells me, hey, I'm going to law school. And so uh, that was pretty fun. So then he joined us as well. He went to the U of M. And uh, yeah, so then my other brother joined as a lawyer. And that's been pretty cool. And then my sister, she joined as a paralegal. She graduated from Eau Claire and she joined. And then eventually my mom, who's a nurse now, or wasn't, she is a nurse still, but she now joined the office and like does a lot of record review and things with us on complicated cases because she was a nurse in the ER and like the old folks home and she has a lot of uh, experience that way now. So it's pretty cool. That's cool. You got your mom on payroll now? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, my mom's too like kind of a fan favorite at the office because she's like, the you know how nurses are always really like kind and caring. They are the and, nicest, like, every, most patient people. Yes. Yeah. So everybody loves her. The only thing is now that she works more from home after that, like when the pandemic st started, she started working from home uh, more, uh, so she's not in as much. But yeah, like all everybody loved her. Like you know, they'd ask her questions about you know everything. If when you're a nurse, you get all kinds of questions. But yeah, so she still works with us, and um, that's pretty awesome. So. How's the family dynamic? Do you arguing much with your brother or cousins, or are you uh, pretty pretty smooth? It's yeah, actually pretty smooth. My brother Adam and I, which is the one um, that's two years younger, him and I butt heads on things once in a while. But like he's a he's good he's a good dude, and like. A lot of times, you know, sometimes he's right. Other times I'm right, but he usually comes around to it. Like, so if we get in a little bit of arguments about stuff, we usually move past it. So that's good. It's, that's it's that's a, important when you got a family business going. Yeah. Yeah. You've obviously grown a lot since those days. What was the biggest break that you've ever got? Or when did you really start seeing a, a high growth trajectory? Um, It's kind of, there's a few things that happen. I mean, I'd say the biggest break and it, it sounds kind of, it, it was it's sad for the economy, but when I was a brand new lawyer, 2007, you know, I was kind of doing a lot of lawyers when they go out, if you're going to be, and I don't know how many people do it anymore, but it used to be more common. Like you hang a shingle, right? Like I said, I had that little office. So I was kind of doing general practice because you just need work. And so whatever's coming in, I did a lot of family law. I mean, that's how I got a lot of trial experience and courtroom experience. I was doing family law, some criminal stuff, some civil, anything that would come through the door. And it was a lot of fun. It was pretty stressful. I mean, now looking back, it was fun, but at the time it was kind of stressful. Um, I used to like actually get so stressed out in the morning that I would eat breakfast sometimes and go throw up because I mean, I was one man. I'd, I fortunately, I was able to find mentors that would like help me. And one was a judge now, and he's still like just the other day, I'd ask him for something. Um, just I needed some kind of um, reference thing. And, you know, he's always been there for me. It's really cool. But basically, um, I was doing that work and folks started calling me in like 2008 like hey i've got these debt issues and so i was trying to find a place to send them and I, people kept calling and calling and so i reached out to an attorney that was in new richmond and i said hey i think i'm gonna try some of these the bankruptcy cases at that time and he's like well don't do it alone and he's like come over and he actually took me out for like a burger and stuff and he had a paralegal that was kind of a contract paralegal so then she started helping me and then i got pretty heavy into bankruptcy because we had that great recession so um, the cool thing about that, I mean, obviously I helped grow the business at the time, but like we got to help a lot of people out, save their homes, get rid of debt. Um, I actually got, believe it or not, I got trial experience in federal court because banks couldn't believe that like people should be able to discharge debt. So they would like argue fraud. And so I'd fight for small business owners. And I, I put, uh, you know, I won against a couple of banks. So that was pretty awesome. And, you know, you're fighting for the little guy and the family. And um, so that, that was, that's kind of one of the things that got me going. And I was always doing a little bit of personal injury work, but personal injury work is really competitive. I mean, you got people like Gruber and, you know, you got Habish, there's all these law firms and they had a big budgets and they'd been around for decades. So it took me a long time to kind of get to the point where I could market enough, you know, had enough funds to market and just to re eventually rely on it. And, um, I, you know, I was doing family law quite a bit and that's a pretty stressful 
practice area. So right. one day I just decided, uh, you know, no more family law. We're just going heavy into the injury law, and you know, and that's what we did. So. Was that was that a big point for you when you were able to narrow your focus and say say no to other things? I know it's it's hard as a business owner, and we deal with this sometimes in the marketing world because there's so many different services you can ask for ask from people, and so many different services our clients are asking for. But I feel like sometimes it's better just pick a lane and and go all in there. I think you should if you can do it. I mean, like you said, when you're starting out or when you're just, it's hard to say no to people, yeah, especially when you want to, you can know that you can help people, um, especially when you're, you know, you're trying to make payroll for all your employees and things. Yep. But I do think if you can get in like a, a, you know, a niche and you can kind of focus, you get better at it. I think the word gets out that you're, you know, that's what you do. You know what you're doing. And I found out like, you know, I think for anybody, even what you guys do too, right? Whatever, whatever you're in, if you can like, perfect your craft or get better and better at it there's a lot of satisfaction in that I mean one you do a better job eventually for your customers or clients or whomever but you start to just like satisfaction you know because we work obviously to earn money to you know pay bills get you know get food and stuff but you start to really enjoy perfecting your craft and getting better and, and that has a lot of satisfaction I think that's even another reason to like focus it when you're able to do it yeah I agree very well said um, sticking on the business side of things how has your marketing really evolved over the years? I heard you designed your first billboard, that billboard that was in 2009, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Basically, one day I was like, man, I should get a billboard. So I put a billboard on um, when you're coming back from the Twin Cities. How, to get how to big Wisconsin. were you at this time? Oh, man, I probably was like, I might have had two employees, like okay. a cousin and maybe a legal assistant. <laughs> so yeah, probably a legal assistant. And it's funny because I have like some folks too that would work for me part time, you know, and help out here and there. So I might have had two employees maybe besides myself. But I was like, you know what, I'm getting this billboard because all the traffic commuting back to Wisconsin from the cities. If I have a billboard, they're all going to know me and see me. So I put up a billboard and I really just took this picture that I think I had my wife take that I'd put up on my website, which is like me standing in this kind of, it wasn't a courthouse, but it was like, it looked like a courthouse in downtown St. Paul. Like it was a cool area. It was, I think the James J. Hill library. So kind of historic and really cool. So I put that up and then next to it, I had like all the, I think all my practice areas, which were mini at the time. And it was just a lot. I don't think it was a success. I, I do know the people that did see it were generally like, um, other lawyers and judges and I not everybody thought that was pretty cool they were kind of like well you got a billboard you know what kind of lawyer are you gonna be and all this stuff but it was a start you know so you have to sometimes you just have to try something and see how it works and eventually evolve to where we are now but you know you're talking over over a decade later you have a very hectic life so you're a practicing lawyer you're responsible for running a business you have five kids that are all between the ages of like five and 14 or so, something in that range um, how, how do you, how do you balance everything? Yeah. I I've, mean, I've got one business in a, in a puppy and it's, it's a little hard. Hey, puppies are a lot of work though. Um, yeah. So yeah, one, you're yeah, pretty close three to 14, five different, five boys. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I mean, I'm gone a lot, especially during the week, but on the weekends I try to be home and like, you know, I've, I've actually got into coaching one of their basketball teams, uh, at the YMCA. So that's been pretty fun. So I try to do Somebody told me a long time ago, like, when you're going to be there with them, be present. So, you know, rather than, like, hanging out at home, but you're checking your phone or whatever. So I, I try to balance it, but I'm not great at it. Um, but at the same point, too, it's kind of like you when you choose something, you, I, I, there's, like, a good Vince Lombardi quote. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but, like, the price for success is once you de you decide that you and your family are ready to pay it, like, that's what happens. And so hopefully when they're when they're older, they won't hold it against me. But I do work hard to get them, I mean, I have them involved in some of my commercials, but I do work hard as when I'm home to be present and to like to get to some, you know, to do things with them. And um, we go on vacations, like I'm working hard right now so I can go on this vacation in the first two weeks of April because then I got trials after that. So I try to do that stuff so they have some good memories every year. You know, we went out snowboarding in January out to Colorado for a week, so like that's pretty cool. And then we have a cabin in Northern Wisconsin and what we typically do now in the summer is They'll like live up there and then I'll use that as my kind of home base. So I have a little like bunkhouse thing right by the water that I use in my office. And then I'll just drive to court, you know, so I might be actually living out of a hotel in some other town. But when I come back home, I'm not going to Hudson. I'm going up to the cabin. So 
So hopefully when they're older, they'll, they'll, it'll be, they won't be upset with me, but that's well, that's how you're coaching hoops. How, how old is that one? Um, he is in sixth grade. So fifth and sixth graders, man. How many technical fouls have you gotten? Me? Okay. Well, I, so here I'm pretty good, uh, because, and this is one of the reasons is as a, so, you know, my oldest is 14. So I watched a lot of basketball and I've seen the coaches and I've seen the fans and I, I do get excited but I've always really tried to work on keeping it positive. Uh, so the why was asking me to, to coach the next session because I was like, I think I'm taking a break. And they were telling me, like, you get so energetic out there. And I, I really try to keep it all very positive. So I haven't got any technicals. I do, when they're not listening, though, I will come out with kind of the angry timeout. You know, like, timeout, you know, <laughs> like, get in here, guys. But I figured, too, like, one of the things, you know, it's fifth and sixth grade basketball, and you're in there, they're getting better, and I feel like, it's a fundamentals thing, and we're learning. There, I keep the practices high paced because I'm kind of that guy too. I have that energy, but at the end of the day, too, like I think, and a lot of us learn this, and you probably, if you played sports too, right? Like, sports are more than just the sport itself. It's like teamwork. It's ups and downs. It's like life lessons. So I'm trying to incorporate that. I mean, I'm not perfect at it, but I'm also like teaching them that, like, you know, there's just because you didn't make a basket, like you might have set an awesome pick. Like, there's so many things that you can do. And then on top of it, like just being a good sport, being a good teammate, um, you know, not getting down. I mean, there's games where we've been down and we're in the scores, right? But they, they, we get to halftime and bam, you know, we come back and win it. And it's just like there's so many life lessons. So, but yeah, I haven't got any technicals. Hopefully, I don't. I just get the angry timeout once in a while. I, get over here. I, I had to ask. So my dad, who was also on the road a ton for business when yeah. I was growing up, he was my middle school basketball coach, fifth awesome. through eighth grade, and. I had to give John Burke a shout out. Two career technical fouls in the, in, the, in, the, in the Madison Parochial School League. He had one clipboard toss and then was uh, melting off to a ref once. I remember who I think was a high schooler with a ponytail and <laughs> turned around and told him to be an example and, and got teed him, him out up. Of there, so man. Shout out to JB. Great Dude, yeah, coach. Shout out. Though. <laughs> hey, I mean, the cool thing is obviously he had a lot of heart and energy in the game you know and it's 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 sports are that way you get into it man you get into it and, oh, and he had he had a lot of heart and energy <laughs> the guy guy only has one gear absolutely I, lo I love that I great love that. human being though yeah very oh. awesome <laughs> yeah those are great memories growing up yeah so that's cool you're doing that all right let's move on to some quicker questions what is the craziest thing that you have ever seen in a courtroom um, well, I don't know. There's a few really crazy things. I'd say one crazy event when I was actually a uh, family law is we had a whole trial over a dog. So that was really crazy. Now, and I'm not saying anything wrong with the dog, but About custody of the dog? custody of the dog. And, um, my guy was this really big guy with his little dog and it, his soon to be ex-wife well, like, apparently it was, she was the one who wanted the dog, but you know how dogs are, right? Like the dog might become, sometimes it's one family member they just bond with, right? And so he really wanted the dog. And I was like, all right, man, well, um, in Wisconsin, unfortunately, dogs are just considered property, right? So they're just divided like normal property. But I had an idea that the judge was probably a dog guy because I grew up around dogs too. And you just kind of, I don't know, I had a feeling. So the other attorney goes in with the whole judge, this is property, blah, blah, blah. And I told my guy, when you get up on the stand, you're going to tell this judge how many every little thing that this dog means to you with your walks so he gets up there and you know i go through all of it and he just talks about how much he loves this dog and yeah he wasn't didn't want to buy the dog originally but over the last so many years they become best buddies and then so we get done and the judge says in wisconsin dogs are property but we all know they're a lot and i was like we won <laughs> and so uh, we won on the dog thing, and I mean, he was so happy. But it it was just it was, so that was I don't know if that was a crazy story, but I I remember telling the other attorney beforehand. I said, "Are we gonna have a whole trial here on a dog?" And he's like, "Yup." And I was like, oh, "Okay." So, oh, how much in attorney fees do you think were racked up over that? Dog? I mean, it was like, I mean, it wasn't a full day, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you got lawyers billing at least back then too. I was a discount attorney because I was new, so I always gave a good discount. So maybe my fee was one hundred twenty five, one hundred fifty an hour or whatever. I don't know what the other attorney, but if you add it all up together, I'm sure it was a lot, you know, it was quite a bit for that day. And we could have done, the other thing too is it also pushed out the other issues like, you know, prop, other property, bigger assets and things. But it was a good story, I think. And it was, I was really happy for him because actually when I was, 
because that was when I was um, a smaller law office. So most of my clients were in the community. And so I would see him out sometimes around town with the dog. With and the I would, dog. That's, that's he, cool. Right. And you're like, oh, man, I was so happy for him. But uh, so that's kind of a, a story. You know, I've got some crazier stories, but that was that was I don't know. That's just a memorable story. <laughs> this is just a crazy story. Um, so I had a case because I used to do real estate uh litigation like up in the north woods and so often what would happen is people would have these large you know at one point it was potentially like i wouldn't say a campground but maybe a little resort and not like you know where people had little cabins as part of resort or it was owned by the family but at some point they would like divide it up between the family or they'd sell it and we had a case uh where there was you know i represented one family member another lawyer represented and there was a fight over who would get what and all this stuff and who was supposed to get what or whatever. And so we went to a mediation at the courthouse and we get there and the mediator goes, uh, I just heard something this morning, guys, and I don't think this case is going to get resolved today. I'm like, okay, what's that? He's like, well, one of the other gentlemen that's, uh, uh, says he's got an ownership interest, went to all the cabins last night and spray painted his name on it. Like, you know, like tagging it, like, it, like if I write my name on it, I own it. Uh, we ended the case ended up going to trial and, uh, yeah, the judge was not impressed with that kind of stuff, obviously, but yeah, you went up there. I, I, I don't know what would possess it. Like if you spray paint your it was, name, it was, yours. it was a trial over the cabins and he just went and spray painted his name on him. Like yeah, he apparently he thought like that would give him ownership if he wrote his name with a spray paint bottle on it. I mean, which obviously just fired up everyone else. He right? wasn't, he didn't do it as a prank or no, anything. No, it was legit. Like he just wanted to let everybody know he was laying claim. So. That was an interesting one. We could see like trial. Dwight Troop from The Office doing something like that. Maybe he probably would. You know, like that's I I you know I never really got to the bottom of like why like what he thought like that would actually. But I could see Dwight doing something like that, right? I mean, might have been back during The Office era when it happened. <laughs> it might have been. Maybe that was his inspiration. <laughs> yeah, I saw the episode where Dwight paints the whole office black to intimidate. The employees maybe he saw that and spray painted oh, the cabins. maybe it was out of know. intimidation right he, he thought if he spray painted like we would just think this guy is so wild give him whatever he wants right i personally would not want to mess with a guy who would go out in the middle of the night and spray paint his name on on cabins you don't know what that guy's got up his sleeve so i don't know if it worked out for him in the case it seems like well, maybe not but uh, it, yeah it maybe it would have initially but i i think uh once we went to trial the judge <laughs> was kind of like yeah that's not how we uh, claim things around here <laughs> like any funny or crazy loopholes that you have exposed or seen used during a case? Um, uh, I'm trying to think what would like a loophole. I do know once when I was doing a, I was tri doing a trial, a uh, divorce trial, and um, I've had a couple of these where basically you send over we call discovery and you'll get you'll ask for all these records and documents and anything that they have and usually authorizations too and you'll get the authorization sent out to whatever financials or um, records and then basically you get that stuff back and oftentimes you're going to give copies to the defense counsel but i think sometimes they just forget to look through it so I was thinking of two instances. Once I had a, a divorce trial and the, not my client, but the uh, soon to be ex-husband said on the stand that he had lost all of this investment through the market and the market was just terrible. And so he, I had, he had, he had only given me through his attorney, like certain statements and there was just some having to be missing, but I sent out the authorization and got all the statements. And so I'm like, you know, I got him up there. This is like, I don't know what they call like a Perry Mason moment. And I'm like, so you lost all stuff. He's like, yeah, market was terrible, man. Market was terrible. I'm like, well, that's really strange because right before that statement you had, and I show him the missing statement and he goes, where did you get that? <laughs> I said, from your authorization. And he starts like fake crying on the stand. I gave it all away to my son. I gave it to my son. I'm sorry, judge. And it was like the, oh, and, man. And it, so I had things like that happen where you like, so it's not really a loophole, but it's just funny because like we have that too in text messages. There'll be a driver that causes an accident. And I had a case like that once and he was a young kid and he went through this intersection and hit my client. And the, the insurance company was saying like, my client was at fault. 
And I was like, this doesn't make sense at all. So then I got his text records. And again, his attorney didn't look at him. So we were doing a deposition. That's where you get to ask questions under oath. And I'm like walking him through. And I'm like, so you came up to that intersection and, and what were you doing? You, you were looking down at your phone, weren't you? And he kind of looks at me. And then I slide him over the, the text thing. And he didn't even, I mean, it doesn't have the actual text. It just shows the time. But he knew in his heart of hearts in his head. And his, he was a probably 19-year-old or 20-year-old kid. And he had, I also thought because he had left his girlfriend's house and I don't know if there's something, maybe they're in an argument, but you know, he's probably texting or she's texting him. But anyway, I slide it over to him and I'm like, and you were texting right through that intersection where he goes, yeah, I was. And his dad jumps up and the lawyer jumps up (laughs) and he's like, and he goes to his dad, daddy busted me. They take him outside and I hear all this (laughs) outside the deposition, but technically in a deposition because it's still ongoing, even though that's your lawyer and there's like a privilege, it doesn't exist in the deposition. So he comes back in and I, and I was being a little feisty at this point. And I was like, not to the kid, but kind of aimed at the dad and the lawyer. And I just said, so now that you went outside with your lawyer and your dad and you're going to change your story. And then the lawyer jumps up and goes, he's not changing his story. And I was like, so you're going to admit, right? You're texting and you know, the case got settled after it, but that was, a, <laughs> that was a pretty interesting one. So how nervous do you get in those situations when you have to call people out for stuff? Um, so not so much just cause I've done it so much. I mean, sometimes you get There's a lot end. at stake. Yeah. And it's how you do it. Like you can, you have to let it sit for a while and work into it. The only thing that I found over time, which has been in, in credit to that kid too. Like he, I mean, yeah, he thought he was caught, but he just told the truth is I try to get people that I'm deposing to just understand that like, and I mean, I, this sounds bad, but no matter what the defense attorney, the attorney that is, you know, basically bond paid for by the insurance company, no matter what they say, and I'm not saying all of them are bad like this because there's a lot of good lawyers out there regardless what side you're on that are ethical and whatnot. But the truth is the truth, man. And like I slide up next to the client and some court reporters don't like it because I sit too close. But I just like, this is your time to just, you're under oath, just tell the truth. And, you know, I circle back and I give them a lot of opportunities and I, you know, usually show them stuff that like, hey, I kind of know what happened. But I found out more and more that people want to tell the truth. And if you give them the opportunity to tell the truth, and often the way I like to sit next to my client or uh, to the person I'm deposing, it's like we have more of a conversation. And so it's not, it doesn't seem as formal. They often will tell the truth. You got to, you know, sometimes you got to help coax them to it. But I think for them, it's kind of like, you know, it's just a relief, right? Like, yeah, I, you know, I did run that stop sign or I did do this. And so, but you, you also get nervous because usually the night before the morning, you, you realize the case hinges on you doing a good job and getting them to testify to the truth. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of that nerve, but I think that's part of the fun too, is like getting amped up and ready and super focused. Right. Yeah. So what's the most impactful case that you've been involved with other than the man getting to keep his dog and <laughs> see him around the neighborhood? Yeah, that, that was a big deal. Um, you know, well, like I, so there's a lot of cases that, uh, there's been terrible injuries and I've been able to often get a substantial recovery and many times that it started out with the actual defense taking the position that the recovery should be zero because my client was at fault. Um, I think though, like I was telling you earlier about one time when I had a bank trying to say that my client who owned a small business had to file bankruptcy because the recession happened. And then they tried to say that he got the funding through like fraud, like fraudulently obtained the funds, which wasn't true, but the bank couldn't just come to terms with like, you know, the guy already lost everything. Let's just hit him for some more. And so when the judge ruled in my favor that he did nothing, well, my client's favor that he did nothing wrong, him and his wife were like crying outside. And I remember just thinking like, if we didn't win that, this bank would be after him forever. And now they get a fresh start. So that, that was pretty cool. Um, I had a big jury trial verdict against a, a, a large company with like about 12 months ago. And that company, like they were just kind of harassing my client and, um saying like he he was at fall he wasn't really injured this and this and this and he was the nicest guy nice blue collar working hard working guy and when we when the jury verdict came back and it was big i mean it was multi-million dollar verdict and that was just so sweet because my client was the nicest guy and one he deserved that money because it really impacted his life big time he went from he was an older gentleman but he was super active like snowboarded um, did all, he did all these different activities outside, you know, snowmobiling, hiking. He was always the guy that like, if you needed him over, he's 
helping build a house, helping build a shed, whatever. And he couldn't do hardly anything anymore because he had neck surgery. But when we won that, um, and it was just, I mean, the money was great for him, but it was like, no, these, this jury like of the community was like, you're right. You know, you were right the whole time. You're not a liar. You weren't making us up. You didn't do anything wrong. And, and that was pretty awesome. And then when we were in the hallway, the jury kind of walked past and like, just all gave us a nod, like, you know, and it was, it was just really therapeutic for him too. Yeah. Um, but I remember telling him because he was super nervous because he was just having to be nervous. And I said, ma'am, because he's going to get up and trial. I said, what's the most comfortable place like in the world for you? He's like sitting on my back deck with a beer. I'm like, when you're up on the stand, I'm talking to you. You're on your back deck with a beer, man. And he did it, you know, because he, he was a, he's a real quiet guy, a man of more of action than words. But he got up there and, and you know, it was hard for him to tell the jury that, like, yeah, I'm a changed man now like this. But he did it. And so it was that so that was really impactful, I think, for um, I mean, it was on me, just the whole experience. But for him and his family, uh, it was awesome. And in that company now, I heard, has has been a little bit different when they're dealing with people that get injured on their premises. <laughs> so... You ready to get in to the most bizarre laws in Wisconsin? I think so. Let's see how well, <laughs> let's see, so. let's see how well you do here. Oh, man. Okay. First law. There's a law that mandates serving all apple pies in Wisconsin with a slice of cheese. False. That's correct. Wagon camping prohibition. Camping in a wagon on any public highway is prohibited in Wisconsin with violators risking a fine of up to $10. True. That is actually true. No butter substitutes without permission law. Butter substitutes are banned without permission in public places in Wisconsin. <laughs> is that true? It is true. true. It, it sounds true. It is true. All right, this one. This is this is a big one. You can operate your business using the hours of any time zone in Wisconsin. I think that's false. False. That there is a law against that. Accompanied women at night. This is interesting. An intriguing historical law states that women must be accompanied by a man while walking the street at night. This unusual requirement reflects the historical context of the state's legal landscape. Is that true? It is actually true. Yeah. Seems a little bit outdated. Outdated to say the least, because there's probably a lot of ladies that, you know, guys that might need a lady helping them down the street too, right? So. <laughs> I would agree with that statement. I know several. <laughs> yeah. Probably uh, after the game last night. <laughs> that could have used that. Yeah. Next law. It is illegal not to give a farm animal the right of way on a public road. True. Correct. You must give a farm animal the right of way on a public road. Adultery is illegal. And... It, it is a felony with either jail time or up to a $10,000 fine. I think that's still true. Correct. I know some people who might be in trouble. I was going to say, there's a couple of laws that are outdated that maybe may. There's some people listening to this episode that may not be that happy right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> next law. Are you legally married after being together for seven years in Wisconsin? No. That is correct. There's no common law yeah. marriage in Wisconsin. You can marry your house. False. Correct. That is false. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, you are not allowed to play checkers within city limits. Is that true? That is true, according well, to the internet. You know, I this think you true. and I are going to have to go out uh, and like talk to the legislature about some of the stuff we got going on here. Yeah, local I, government. I could, I could really go for a game of checkers across <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wisconsin. Okay, like, come this, on. This may be the craziest one. In Connorsville, Wisconsin, do you know where that is? Um, kind of right up the road from you. I looked. At, I looked at it on a map. Which county is it? In? Is it Dunn County? I believe this is in Dunn County, okay. Wisconsin. There is no shooting off a gun while your female partner is having an orgasm. I I don't even, I don't even know how to answer that. Like, th let's go let's go. True, true. 
you're, you're kind of acting like you didn't didn't know what it was in Connorsville's not too far away from Hudson. Did you or do you know anyone who shot off a gun while making love to a female? I, you know, I... I've, I've been involved in a lot of cases. I don't know if I can even talk about it. But yeah, I did. I have not. I have no personal experience. You, you, did, you did not do that in, in your earlier years. In my earlier years, no. No, I did not. But I, I was thinking to myself, <laughs> like, this sounds like it can't be true, but it's just so specific that it probably is true. So and it, it said, yeah, you read that right in Connorsville. This is the law, which means at least one person has done this before, maybe. And we can formally announce it was not Russell Nicolay. <laughs> yes. I, not me, not me. Okay, we'll move on just to some quick Wisconsin questions, and then we will get you out of here. All right, all right. What is your favorite Wisconsin brewery? My favorite Wisconsin brewery. All right, so I have I really like Lakefront Brewery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, over by in Hudson, there's a few breweries, Hop and Barrel. So it's really hard to pick one, but I know Lakefront. I've been a huge fan of for a long time. Um, Rush River. If you ever had Rush River. Uh, it's actually like kind of in River Falls, a little bit south of. Um, I think I have. So Bree and I were on a uh, a bar crawl in your area yeah. around Christmas, and I went to Hop and Barrel. They had a Christmas cookie lager yeah. or something. It was very good. So I'm a fan of Hop and Barrel, right on that main road in Hudson. And I think we did go to Rush River. Yeah, Rush is River that the one good. that's in like a massive barn type building, or is that a different one? Yeah, there's a warehouse. You're thinking, I think Tattersall. Tattersall. Okay. In, there's Tattersall there too, but yeah, um, Rush River's got some good beer, some strong beer. Um, but there's yeah. good. There's good beer in your neck of the woods. Yeah, I Liney, mean, Liney Lodge isn't too far away. Yeah, I think you're. You can if you're if you get a brewery that's legit Wisconsin brewery. Generally, there's going to be some good beer there, I think. But uh, yeah, we're fortunate on the western side. I mean, obviously, Milwaukee's known for beer, like right. It's like kind of the genesis of beer in Wisconsin. So yep. can't really go wrong. I'm happy to show you around sometime when it's maybe not the middle of the day on a Thursday, and you got a little more time on your hands. Or not, right? <laughs> or you, you, you don't have to sell me too hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your favorite Wisconsin food? My favorite Wisconsin food. That's a really good one. Um, I think that my favorite Wisconsin food would probably be, if you consider Wisconsin food, be like chili. Is that Wisconsin food? Can we consider that Wisconsin food? I think we can pass chili off as Wisconsin food. I don't know. I've always liked it. You know, in, in, in Green Bay, too, we had the Booyah stuff, too. That was pretty good. Um, I have no clue what that is for... Yeah. This could be your favorite Wisconsin food. What's what's booyah? Well, it, it's it's kind of like a soup mixture. Um, but what happened? We used to like when I lived in Green Bay, my neighbor would base it like they would be. You have it like cook it outside. We it was it was like a big thing. It was like a big kind of like community almost like soup type thing. It was really awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I think like chili is just where it's at for me. And I mean, and I'm Wisconsin, so I really love cheese. So I'm always putting cheese and then. Probably too many crackers in it. And, yeah, that's especially with the cheese and crackers edition. We can we can pass chili off as favorite Wisconsin food. Well, what's your favorite Wisconsin food? Probably cheese curds. Yeah, I, Fri I, fried cheese. I try and avoid them as much as possible. But if they're on the menu, yeah, I think cheese curds are pretty much. I mean, anywhere you go and you get cheese curds, there's usually like beer. So then you get some beer with your cheese curds. Pretty awesome. Um, I know. Where, where was I? So, oh, I was at Lambeau Field and my kids, we were getting cheese curds and they had like chicken tenders and all that stuff. And I just wanted to not have to go back and forth. So I just bought a ton of it, right? We went out there and my one guy, I think he's already overdid it on junk food and he couldn't eat any of more of his cheese curds. And this lady next to me is like, that's like a crime in Wisconsin not to finish your cheese curds. And I was like, trust me, man, he's at way too much cheese curds. We're not going to push about this one, but, you know, cheese curds are awesome. So, You spoke of cheese curds and beer combo. One good brewery with great cheese curds here is Eagle Park. All right. They have really good beer. If you want to have four IPAs and some cheese curds and just go into a coma for the rest of the evening. Eagle Park is a fantastic <laughs> spot to do that. Coma. They have great beer. They have great curds. If you want to pound like a thousand calories worth of beer and some cheese curds on top of that, Eagle Park is my favorite place to go for that. That's kind of good. outing. I'm going to check it out. It, it is good. They got one on Brady Street and then another in Muskego. Favorite Wisconsin getaway spot? 
Um, all right. Well, so as a kid, we'd always like most people go up to Door County once in a while, right? Um, but my favorite, like favorite Wisconsin part is so anywhere when you get north, like north of eight. I mean, that's a long way from Milwaukee, but um, when you get north of eight, does Manaqua pretty- qualify? Is that yeah, north I think of that's eight? north of eight. Um, generally when we, so, cause my family's all from Western Wisconsin, like the Eau Claire, Oliva area. So we would go up, uh, like you can follow the Chippewa river up and then it goes to like the, the Chippewa and the Flambeau. And so up there's really, really awesome area. But now where my cabin is that I have, it's North of eight, um, by considerable amount. It's like basically in the South end of Douglas County. Douglas County is the County that Superior is in. So it's just the middle of nowhere. What town is it in? Um, so it's right by Minog. If you know, like Minog, it's, it's famous for beef jerky. That's okay. where the Lynx beef jerky is from. Ah, um, how far is it from Superior? Uh, to my cabin, maybe fifty minutes. Okay, so you're just a little south of there. Yeah, and but that, I mean, very very cool. Tons of pine trees. Very rural still. Uh, the water up there is awesome because it's got that kind of sandy soil. So all the lakes, and this is kind of like if you go north of Green Bay too, like in the Crivets area, they have similar lakes that way too. But, um, you know, they're not flowage, so they're kind of like, they call them seepage out of the water table. But like uh, the lake that we go to, it's like 15, 20 feet clear. Like it's just awesome, man. It's so, uh, you know, they got, we got wolves up there. You've got all kinds of eagles. And so. It's a little different than Bradford Beach in Milwaukee where I think you can see yeah. about two inches down. Yeah. At, at Water Park, slightly north of the city is, is more clear. Yeah, I think if you can get up into the north, it doesn't have to be all the way up north of eight, but uh, if you can get up there, like that's to me like quintessential, just like Wisconsin North Woods, relaxing. Okay, favorite Wisconsin supper club? There's a place called, uh, and I don't know, I, I would call it considered a kind of a supper club, and it's it's near my cabin. It's uh, it's called uh, Pogo's, but man, that place is pretty sweet. So Pogo's. Pogo's, yeah. It's right on the um, Minog Flowage and uh, right on the water yeah right on the little flowage yeah you pull up you know they've got people and you can pull up your uh, pontoon they've actually got a little boat launch there which is a source of entertainment too as you know boat launches all kinds of stuff happens there but yeah it's it's a pretty cool place i mean it's like the one place to eat in in that in the on the flowage at like right by the right by my cabin so we go we'll, there. C- we'll count that pogos all right. pogos tell, Fav- tell Richie favorite I favorite wisconsin sports team uh i mean i so I spent most of my life in Green Bay, so it's going to be the Packers. Uh, you know, my brother Adam and I used to go to the Packers practices, and this is before Green Bay was what it is now. And so, you know, it was like the Don Hudson practice field. It was a lot different, right? And we used to go down there, and I just remember it wasn't all the fanfare. There was like some bleachers. You could get a seat on the bleachers easy for practice. Um, when, you know, you get further into or closer to the season, they would put up the uh, like green tarp on, on the on the fence, and my mom would pull her van up, and we would sit as kids up on top and still watch because like oh, they know we're not we're not spying for the Bears, man. But yeah, so the Packers are big, were big for me, you know, growing up in Green Bay, and like most kids too. I was talking to somebody the other day about this is like you know the Packer game was on, and you'd be outside with your friends playing football, and then like coming in and check on it. But in the '80s and early '90s, you know, Packers weren't doing so great. Then obviously Brett Favre came along and Reggie White, and things changed. But yeah, Packers. I love the Brewers too. I think um, I told you too that my brother, when we lived in Sheboygan, my brother Adam and I and my dad would go down to County Stadium. And that was pretty fun. So absolutely, favorite Wisconsin winter activity. So I used to really like to snowmobile. Um, we, I've gotten, I got into snowboarding at. at I think in high school. So I'd say that's probably it now is snowboarding. My kids, I was fortunate. I started getting them into snowboarding like when they could barely walk. And so on what in the western side of Wisconsin, because when I grew up in Green Bay, there wasn't a lot of places. I think there was like hidden, so Hidden Valley was kind of south, or you had to go up to Michigan. We'd go up to Michigan. But in uh by Hudson, it's like 45 minutes from there's Troll Hogan, super good place, or you can go over to uh what we call Afton Alps. It's right, it's it's part of the epic system so we like where we are now we have good access i mean the snow hasn't been great this year but they've been making fake snow but yeah i think snowboarding is probably the big activity um i used to like to hike and, and snowshoe but i broke my foot wakeboard in the summer so i've been a little oh. bit yeah it's, it's doing much better now <laughs> sounds like a painful annoying injury yeah it was and it and i like to run and i couldn't run and then even though you know i should know better i didn't follow all the the rules with the boots not. and the 
crutches and so that delayed my my healing so doing good now <laughs> ah, dude, i'm doing good now. all right good uh favorite summer activity uh definitely being at the lake like i said i like to wakeboard i grew up wakeboarding a lot um and so we spent a lot of time on the lake wakeboarding and uh my kids like the fish a lot i have one of those like it's a mini pontoon i don't know if you've ever seen it it can like fit it's supposed to be like two people but we probably put five on it and it's got a little electric like trolling motor and so we go out and fish on that thing and they really love it so you know it's basically hanging at the lake doing fishing and then we go wakeboarding a bit and that's pretty awesome so. nice final question i got for you is there any message or anything you want to say to the people in milwaukee um yeah i just like i i really appreciate the fact that i mean it's awesome to be back on the eastern side of wisconsin now we've been here it's almost been two years so but you know now people are getting to know us a little bit better but um the opportunity to be here and help folks out in milwaukee um you know that's great we've got employees and lawyers uh that work at our milwaukee office from the milwaukee area and i'm hoping to get in uh, more with the milwaukee community we've got some partnerships on the on the horizon and it's great i'm hoping to spend more time over here like i said i grew up on the eastern side of, of wisconsin and you know being in sheboygan being in green bay i traveling to milwaukee a lot when i came into milwaukee this morning i was just like Oh yeah. I, I don't know. Milwaukee just, I love the vibe here. I just love it, man. So, uh, I appreciate everyone that's, you know, allowed us over the last couple of years to represent them and the folks that will in the future. And, um, you know, hopefully we get to spend more time in the community kind of giving back and helping out. And that's what we'll work on as well, because we like to be good stewards of, of for the community as well.